Please come Ash. Yeah. Uh, hello everyone and thank you for joining this Friday. And this is the fourth and last uh, Hyperledger Meetup series in the Hyperledger Pune Meetup. Uh, organized by Hyperledger Pune and uh, Hyperledger. And uh, in the, uh, the agenda of the series, the kind of educating and awareness about the blockchain hype to production network. So like uh, when we talk and educate the industries and the business people, there is confusion to like blockchain is just hype what Gartner cycle says, so there is a kind of maturity is uh, not in the technology. So to kind of educate the uh, industry and people how this scenario is changed in the last couple of years and how hyperledger technology and hyperledger fabric is contributing and change this uh, thinking. So uh, in starting uh, two sessions, uh, IBM, Tech Mahindra, Chainyard and other companies presented their production global networks and trust your supplier, SNF future tax, uh, SNF cert, and many such solutions presented. Then in the third series, Gary Singh and the Hyperledger Fabric contributor uh, talked about the how the Hyperledger Fabric technology changed in a couple of uh, years, like uh, adding the different feature, different consensus mechanism, and all about. So this four series is talked to give the update about the now the newcomer in new technologies and new founders are also considering the Hyperledger Fabric tech and uh, applying in their solution. So the first presentation we have uh, from the Ansul Jain, he's the co-founder and CEO of HeCode. And HeCode is some kind of healthcare solution. So it's not just the only the electron, electronic health record. It's a couple of different healthcare solution in the one umbrella. And they are using the Hyperledger fabric. And uh, I think it's good to be uh, present in this current situation of COVID. And uh, recently the mandate in some kind of uh, by the Indian government to kind of mandate the digital records in the for the healthcare. So, over to you, Ansur. Yeah. Hello. Thank you, Kamlesh. Thank you for the introduction. So, hello, guys. Uh, my name is Ansur Jain. I'm co-founder at Hekord. At Hekord, we are working on smart healthcare solutions. So, a little bit about Hekord. Um, Hecode is uh, working on personal and connected electronic health records management system with blockchain technology and a patient management system to make uh, medical practice easier. Our major, our major focus is on maintaining health records digitally so the patients can get, get their health records at one tap, anytime, anywhere in the world. Uh, the product that we are building is interactive and intuitive. Uh, it's generally for the businesses like clinicians, hospitals, diagnostic centers, and everybody that is in the healthcare industry and serving the patients. The, we are building this uh, product with a vision that uh, we are giving the control to the patients of their medical data, which is not yet being done uh, in, in India and most part of the world as well. All this is being developed on EHR standards of India, HL7 and HIPAA compliances as well. Now, if I uh, talk about the healthcare market, the healthcare market is not very well established in, uh, in India and there are a lot of problems with it. The problems come uh, like complexity with the health records. Due to the very nature of the centralized uh, healthcare system, complexity is over record keeping and communication can be hindered. Uh, the, the records are also sometimes lost. And unfortunately, the patients have to pay in the end. If, uh, if, a, if I talk about a country where there is no centralized system, the patients have to carry a physical record to every uh, organization that they go through. If, if as a patient, patient, I have to consult another doctor, then I will have to either carry all the documents or get everything checked up again uh, for, for that particular doctor. Then there are problems like medical insurances and frauds. Uh, fraud, as we all know, is an ever increasing problem. And many anti-fraud associations also estimate that hundreds of millions of dollars are lost each year due to fraud in medical, in medical industry. Then there, there are li lack of reliable reviews. Uh, as we know, whenever a particular doctor in, in 2020, a particular patient goes out in the search of a medical service provider, they go for online reviews. But all those online reviews, like much e-commerce websites, are uh, unreliable and fake as well. Then we have the problem of fragment fragmented health record. Again, if I talk about uh, different healthcare institutions, like let's say two big hospital chains, they have their own EHR platform. 
but they do not they hr and patient management services are not interconnected which means that their the data is shared freely within the uh, organization but the patient doesn't have access to it so for the overall healthcare industry it uh, sort of creates a silo effect so, uh, for which again the patient has to pay and i think in in 2020 it's high time that we uh, st- uh, where everything is accessible at at an instant it is very unfair for the patients to uh, are not being able to access their own data uh, that easily then all the software uh, whatever software the health organization is using in the back end is not made with the intent of patient centricity patients are very much engaged in the decision making regarding their health and even uh, consulting multiple doctors has become a has become a, an accepted course of action but they can it's not very easy to do it if you are in the later stage of the treatment then uh, comes the inadequate patient privacy uh, you guys might know that in india it just it was just in news yesterday that big uh, healthcare chains law, uh, were found uh, found out that their data was leaked from their laboratory management system and hospital management system so uh, i just want to shed light on how big this issue is because the patient the software is even if they are cost effective or they are easy to use they are not as good as uh, they should be in terms of medical privacy because medical data as we know is very sensitive now coming to the proposed solution um how hecord help helps uh, at hecord we are uh, we are including every medical agent which includes doctors laboratories pharmacies medical insurance center and bringing them under a bunch of products that are interconnected to blockchain the products are uh, easy to use they are highly efficient they are cost effective and they are secure as well they are easy to use because we are paying special attention on the medical workflow of the doctors and all the stakeholders included they are secure and cost efficient because we are uh, implementing this on a a uh, blockchain and <clears throat> they're highly efficient because as we estimated it almost cause uh, saves a particular doctor 20% per uh, of the time per visit uh, when they are using a software like this and in india very less number of doctors are actually using a uh, practice management software during their practice our first product is our smart healthcare management solution it is uh, essentially a patient management system and uh, it has the classic uh, patient kiosk ch- uh, check in uh, it has uh, it is integrated with a laboratory management system smart inventory management system for the hospital and uh, medical billing software as well so we are bringing every software that a hospital organization needs under a single uh, software which uh, uh, for which the uh, for which the permission can be granted uh, based on the needs of the particular hospital since it's highly customizable um it actually leaves a lot, lot of space for the uh, hospital administrator and the clinic management to uh, customize it in their own way at zero added cost <laughs> this is a uh, an overview of how the software looks since it's it's a full fledged uh, uh patient practice management system and an emr basically and it, it can be customized on the basis of the practice and uh, options can be removed and added Uh, as per choice and billing then other one is a consumer health app the consumer health app is essentially for uh, the patients to access their digitized medical records so that uh, uh, so the their digitized medical records which are uh, available to them by the doctor but apart from that uh, it can be used to grant access to a particular organization and revoke access as well as patient controls their own data there's no other organization that can outpower them it uh in addition to that uh, the, the particular patient can also book doctor's appointment book medicines online and diagnostic services as well this is a mock up of our consumer health application the first one is the home page then there's the user profile third is how test doctors and medications can be booked and fourth one is how they can access their own medical records which is segregated into different sections and everything is digitized not photographed but digitized this is the overview of the market like the the global market is of 207 billion dollars healthcare market uh, healthcare it market 
and it is expected to rise to $390 billion by 2024. Uh, the players who have a grip on the market are not essentially changing their product according to the doctor's workflow. A lot of markets stay, a, doc, a lot of doctors in the market stay away from these products. Then benefits of Hecode includes an extended user control. Since you're using blockchain, the patient becomes the owner of their own data, which is which is not yet being done, and they can grant access and revoke access in a secure and efficient manner. Then <clears throat> the health data revolution is coming because uh, we're bringing it in as uh, we are making the data available from multiple different organizations, and yet we are not centralizing it uh, like countries like Canada have tried to do. We are decentralizing it, which is uh, providing it with more security for the data, more reliability, and yet it is av available to every healthcare organization which the patient wants to be with. We are bringing in transparency as uh, everything that happens over blockchain uh, is auditable in a manner and can be uh, uh, used as a tool to make the whole process very transparent. <clears throat> then. Uh, the, with, the, with the help of, a block, uh, of the blockchain, the interclinical communication is also increasing as most uh, as the, when the data, uh, patient's data is available to two different doctors, they can actually access it, uh, which is not yet being done as every organization uses their own uh, patient management system and most organizations, organizations do not use any. We are, uh, we are obviously uh, working on medical data security as we are that's one of the reasons why we are actually implementing blockchain because we want to make it as secure as possible. We are digitizing on blockchain because our, our priority is securing the patient data. The, 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 the data has maximum security from cyber threats and theft and blockchain is both transparent and private and permissioned uh, due to hyperledger. Thus it keeps the identity of the patient secure. Then it's quick and efficient. And again, the patient controls their data. Decentralized nature gives full transparency and control of uh, the data to the patient and not to the healthcare organization, which is currently true. So we are uh, using Hyperledger because it's private and permission blockchain. There is no unknown identities can access the data. Again, uh, increased data protection due to permission nature, inter interoperability, which is very important for any healthcare organization and multiple of healthcare organization as well. Then again, less competition is required for transactions which makes it more feasible uh, in terms of cost. Here, um, all, the organization, uh, all the organizations can access the patient's data when the patient wants them to. For example, if I am a doctor and uh, you are a patient, you can, access, uh, you can give me time-based uh, access to, uh, so that I can access your data, I can go through it, I can read it and I can append it, but it's on uh, your call when you want me to do it. So we are essentially giving the patient the complete command over their data. But this is how it looks. Uh, uh, this is the kind of organizations that you are trying to include. It includes patients, hospital, pharmacies, insurance. And then the applications that we have are EMR, a consumer health app, and a med medical inventory management solution, and a medical billing software. It all goes through and all the organizations get connected to each other through the blockchain. Uh, so, so the first use case uh, for our product is the decentralized medical records and interoperability. Medical organization generally have different EHR vendors, which makes it uh, inaccessible to the patient. The data stays with a particular organization, but the patient can, cannot really access it. If they want to access it, they need to go to, they need to visit the organization, get a physical copy, and then take it to another organization. So this creates a silo effect and the patient has to suffer. When, uh, uh, the, when I talk about this, I am also talking about all the data, uh, which which could be diagnosis, inv investigations, results, medication, and allergies, and the lack of uh, the increase of this risk in medical uh, increases the medical errors and incurs additional cost on the patient. And most of these errors, as it is known, uh, are due to the attributed workflow and communication, errors in communication, and human computer interface, and not by the medical practitioners. So to solve this particular problem, we bought in Hyperledger, and the entire, so that the entire longitudinal patient data
can be retrieved any time by the patient and the healthcare organization when the patient wants them to. Uh, these health records are accessible without uh, aren't accessible without a permission granted by the patient. And like again, a pa if a patient visits a hospital and he has been uh, that person has been treated there previously uh, at any other organization, their data is accessible to this particular organization as well, no matter where they got treated the last time. So this is uh, the kind of uh, interoperability we are trying to bring in so that all the stakeholders and all the medical organization regarding a particular patient is uh, connected in a way and patient controls who access it, but every organization can access, uh, add data to it when they want to. Second is the uh, lack of patient centricity. And like I said, patients are becoming much more engaged in their own decision making regarding the medical workflow and which means they are they have an active role in managing their medical decisions now again in 2020 uh, seeking multiple opinions has become a preferred way and a preferred course of action as well but it is being hampered by the current ehr solutions because every organization has a uh, because every organization has a uh, private practice management solution and which uh, due to which the patient does not really have an access to their data also, these softwares are highly insecure, unsecure. Since the patient do not directly control the data uh, due to these medical, since the patient does not directly uh, control the data due, due to uh, these practice management solution, mo medical data mobility is impaired. The solution that we are trying to bring in for this is that with the access, with, uh, we are giving the control to the patient instead of the organization. We are bringing everything online and nothing is on premise for any uh, of our clients, which makes uh, the patient, the owner of the data and the patient can grant access to whatever organization they want to. It could be a hospital, a small clinic, a laboratory, and uh, it's, it's in the hand of the patient and not the particular organization. Third use case is again, the patient privacy and data ownership. Um, patient privacy is the cornerstone of the good med medical practice. And it's important for both doctors and patients. Patients give uh, their true uh, medical information, but the EHR does not allow patient to have control over who gets to see which portion of data. Uh, uh, so if I visit a particular organization and they do not, uh, I share my data with them. I don't get to choose which uh, particular doctor or which particular lab should see my data. The organization decides this again, but this, should, this shouldn't be this way. And uh, to do that, what we are trying to do is that we are that patients that uh, we are trying to make sure that the patient's data is not uh, not accessible directly on the blockchain, but as uh, but it's uh, rather gets uh, accessed by any medical organization when the patient wants them to. Yeah, if, Ankur, there is a time check, so can you try okay. to get it? Anyway, this is the last last slide. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, the blockchain. Uh, the blockchain will also act as a tag to indicate whether the patient's data has been uh, stored in an encrypted format or not. This makes hair code uh, very much safe and tougher to crack than the current medical systems as the current medical uh, billings, uh, the medical systems are not really secure. They, even when they are on premise, they are not um, completely secure from, from the people working for that organization as well. Or only approved medical practitioners can access the data and among those medical practitioners, only the ones that are approved by the patient can uh, actually read and write the data, uh, write, append to the data. So this uh, inherently audible and timestamped data trail increases transparency and uh, in the health record management and brings greater trust to the healthcare system. Thank you guys. Um, you can contact me through the email and my phone number mentioned here if you have um, any other things. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you, Anshul. So there are a couple of questions in the QA. Can you please uh, respond there? Okay, just a second. So, yeah. Okay, so can you stop saying I will introduce next question? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, next you know, from the Costco uh, is a co founder of Pricey and they are building the kind of some kind of interesting thing about the asset uh, fractional ownership about the green track green text maybe some kind of solar energy or uh, electrical something and uh, 
I think they have good use case. So over to you, Basu. Hey, thank you, Kamlesh. One second, let me just share my screen. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's visible. Yeah, it's visible. Thank you. Okay, great, great. Oh, once again, thanks a lot, Kamlesh. Uh, thanks a lot to the Hyperledger team. This is the second time we are coming in <laughs> into a Hyperledger presentation. The first time we came in was some overwhelming response. Um, so yeah, once again, thanks a lot. We'll start with that. Um, so um, just introduce myself, right? Uh, I'm a co-founder of a brand new uh, fintech company called Paise. Uh, we basically started off about seven months back. Um, in the most basic terms, if I were to explain what we do, um, I'd basically say that we create a brand new avenue uh, for retail investors like you and me to invest into sustainability-based projects, right? Uh, like Kamlesh rightfully told, uh, things like renewable energy, um, electric mobility, um, urban agriculture, and things like that, right? Projects that contribute to social and environmental impact positively. Um, we basically wanted to create a product where people could really attach to that instrument uh, not really think of it as being just another investment platform, but being something that they actually care about and relate to. Um, a, a being in the sustainability sector itself, uh, there have been quite a lot of startups that have come in. Uh, in fact, fractional ownership as a concept itself has been tried and tested in quite a lot of models, or quite a lot of asset classes, but what we really focus on is the sustainability. So if I were to just give you um, a, a quick uh, run through, right, of how the sustainability sector looks today, um, you would basically see just, just in India alone, right, uh, our target is about getting $51.8 billion worth of renewable energy and most importantly, solar energy, right, uh, in India itself by 2022. Um, and in India, you'll see about 67 million retail investors who's willing to have the money and invest in projects like this. The scale and scope like this, when you look at it for any entrepreneur, it's basically like an opportunity that's gonna be missed, right? So you really want to get in, solve the problem, and you see the scale there. Unfortunately, uh, when we actually came across this problem, we realized that there is a problem in terms of the scale of operations itself, right? Uh, there is an issue in terms of, um, uh, in terms of management, in terms of auditing, in terms of running this whole process end to end. Um, there's an issue because a lot of these things that you see, because it's asset backed and fractionalization here in India basically means it's going to be flooded with a lot of paperwork. Right? And when you're talking about sustainability in general, you realize that there's a lot of impact based conversations that start coming in. Right? The fact that you use solar energy over any other form of energy basically means you're going to talk about the amount of carbon sequestered, the amount of greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases that's been reduced, the amount of new jobs that have been created impact factors like this, while makes sense project per project, does not really have a standardized model across different projects, right? So you'll see different people coming up with their own metrics uh, in terms of how they define impact. Um, there's once again, there are a lot of uh, sustainability focused groups in India, right? Uh, easily when we went through Google, uh, we were been able to pinpoint about 100 to 150 sustainability groups who are working in climate action today. But while there is a superficial level of collaboration, there needs to be some form or level of technology that needs to come in to make that collaboration even more substantial, right? And most importantly, when it comes to finance and fintech based applications, there's quite simply a lack of regulatory model between the technology and the regulators itself, right? Uh, especially when we talk about asset fractionalization and asset ownership. So looking at these problems in the sustainability sector, we basically framed our own problem statement, right? What we were going to solve. Uh, we realized there are three basic problems that we're gonna solve. Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to create an alternative investment product, keeping sustainability as a core of our offering, right? Uh, the problem with sustainability-based products is it's not exactly a default choice for people. The entry barrier for a lot of them is very high. Uh, no one really wakes up in the morning and says, hey, listen, I'm just going to sell my petrol scooter and go buy an electric vehicle because it costs anywhere between a lakh, lakh and a half compared to the 25,000 that it would take uh, to buy a, uh, you know, a petrol-based scooter, a fossil fuel-based scooter. scooter. Um, the second thing is obviously record keeping and management and audits, right? Um, in the most bare bones of asset fractionalization, you'll realize that it comes down to the basic paperwork that you've been used to a lot of time. People come in as partners into the companies, uh, there's signatures, there's authorities, there is notarization, there is uh, the regulators in the middle. There's a lot of paperwork that comes in. Uh, and most importantly, 
impact, being sustainability, being the core of what we are offering, we really wanted to create a product with the technology that we're building to standardize the understanding of impact itself, right? And how we could bring in accountability into these projects to see, hey, listen, how do these projects start maximizing their impact goals and how can we track them, right? Uh, with all of this blockchain, to be very honest, uh, as in when you see through our uh, solution, you'll realize that blockchain is quite simply the best possible fit into what we are doing, right? Um, <clears throat> now, blockchain itself as a technology has gone through a lot of uh, ups and downs, right? a lot of realization. Um, initially, it started out being cryptocurrency and ideally people just equated blockchain to cryptocurrency one is to one. Right? Uh, but when technology started evolving, you had Ethereum coming in, you had Hyperledger doing some fabulous job between 2015 to 2019 uh, with a lot of companies like Walmart and IBM coming in and starting to push the idea of blockchain as an enterprise solution people started looking at blockchain being more than just a cryptocurrency, right? They realized that there's an actual business use case uh, that you could solve using blockchain. For us, the two most important principles of blockchain that we are using uh, is ideally tokenization and the idea of collaboration itself, right? Uh, the idea of collaborative networks. Now, uh, to solve our first biggest problem, right? The fact that we're doing fractional ownership of assets. What we really wanted to create was to create a basic blueprint, right? Uh, now, in Paise itself, uh, we are hosting a wide variety of asset classes on the platform, each of them having its own um, you know, pros and cons. Um, you have renewable energy investments, which are more like long-term investments, right? You have solar energy, you have wind energy. Fractionalizing that looks at a longer period of time because the asset life, uh, life cycle itself is about 10 to 20 years. Uh, you also have invoice discounting, which is something we're looking at, uh, which are basically invoices raised towards green projects. Uh, which are mostly short term. And then you have electric mobility, which is midterm, and then urban agriculture, which is again midterm. All of these asset classes, when you look at it, are basically revenue generating assets, right? The underlying asset, irrespective of what it is, it will just end up being a revenue generating asset, right? So why don't we just blueprint the process of ownership, right? Uh, does it really matter for me uh, while auditing to know whether it's a renewable energy asset or a green invoicing asset or an electric mobility asset or an urban agriculture asset. Because at the end of the day, the basic properties of the asset are common across all of the asset classes. Um, there's the amount of term that it is surviving, right? Which is basically the asset life cycle. Um, you basically have the returns that it gives. You basically have the number of people who could own that asset. So what we ended up doing is we started thinking of ourselves as a fractionalization as a service company, right? Uh, we believed in the idea of that internet of value model. What we felt was if we could abstract uh, the kind of asset classes that we have uh, using blockchain itself, right? If we could tokenize some of these assets and keep only the bare bones essentials of it being just that financial product, we could basically streamline this whole process in terms of buying, selling, and transfer of ownership, right? So in the most basic terms, how our tokenization model works is pretty simple. Um, what we basically do is we create an identity token for every asset, right? An identity token is basically a digital representation of a physical asset. It has some of the bare bones essential information of that asset itself, uh, which is basically saying characteristics like the rate of return, the period when it was instantiated, when is it gonna end, right? And the list of all the owners of that asset itself. Uh, an identity token associates with only one asset uh, and there's only one token per asset, right? And it's not fungible. Every identity token that is issued for the asset is further issued with 100 ownership tokens. Now the number 100 is chosen because what we could do is name it like percentage of ownership. So 100 tokens basically represents 100% ownership. And if you owned 1% of the asset, you would basically own one ownership token, right? Now all of these ownership tokens are basically fungible. Uh, which means they work like any other currency, right? Uh, you can transfer it. So any form of ownership for that person is basically identified through these ownership tokens itself. What this allows us to do is to basically take all of these varieties of asset classes, look at, a, look at all of them as just digital representations and tokens. So for a retail buyer, all he has to do is, hey, listen, um, I just saw solar energy project that gives me 12, 13% return per annum. Um, you know what, I'm just going to buy this now without having to worry about all of the paperwork that goes at the back of it. Uh, what we've done is because there's greater level of accountability and auditability that comes with a process like this, uh, we are able to automate the process at the back of it without having to make the user worry about it, right? And what we've done internally as an implementation is we've created a user wallet, uh, which if I were to give you a real world parallel, 
uh, would be something very similar to a DMAT account in a shareholder, right? Um, so what we do here is the user wallet holds all of the ownership tokens across the different asset classes. And on a month on month basis, you would get returns basis, which asset and how many tokens you own for that asset. Now, the core principles of what we're doing, uh, which is basically asset rationalization and ownership got significantly more easier in a model like this for us. Uh, because when you think of it as just a physical process itself, right? Uh, we think of it as partners coming into companies and say, hey, listen, what's his partnership agreements like? Uh, what is the percentage of ownership he has? On a month-on-month -month basis, start editing it. Uh, who are the new partners? Who exited? Give that entire audit trail. Got supremely easier when we went into a process like this. Now, uh, we'll delve into this a little bit more uh, while we uh, answer what the second problem is, right? Which is collaboration. Uh, we realize that in terms of climate action itself, like I said, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of climate collaborative companies as well as forums that are working towards climate change itself. Right? Uh, in India alone, like I said, when I Googled it, I could easily find about 100 to 150 of them. What lacks over here is the understanding and a proper definition of what impact really is. Right? Uh, today, the fact that I'm, you know, there's a pandemic and no one's really going out, um, I could basically say the fact that I used, uh, I, I didn't really go out of my house and use my scooter. I basically saved this much amount of carbon, right? And I reduced this much amount of greenhouse gases. There isn't exactly a proper framework in terms of understanding what impact really is. So what we did uh, essentially is we reached out to a lot of these climate collaborative action companies and forums, right? And we went down to them and asked, hey, listen, why don't we really sit down and make a metric that can be understood by everyone and used by everyone? Right. Uh, how can, exactly can we bring in standardization into this process? <clears throat> Essentially, what we wanted to do uh, was to create a measurability factor. Right. Now, for each asset class, you'll realize there are different kinds of impact that's actually created. Uh, for solar, if you take example, uh, you have the carbon footprint reduction. There's number of trees planted. There's number of jobs created. Heavy metal sequester. Um, you look at electric mobility and you start looking at things like, hey, listen, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide emission that's reduced. You look at urban agriculture and you'll say the amount of heavy metal usage that's reduced, the amount of fertilizer usage that's reduced. Each asset class ends up having its own impact factors, right? And we need to embrace that and start accounting that because there's some genuine value to it. Um, so what we started doing was for every rupee uh, that is saved due to the carbon footprint reduction, we gave it something called a thousand impact score. So 15 rupees for every one lakh rupee that's invested into a solar project, you'd realize that 15 rupees is saved on carbon footprint reduction, four rupees is saved because of trees planted, eight rupees is saved because of the jobs that's created, and there's one rupee that's actually saved because of heavy metal sequestering. So we wanted to make this impact accountable and standardized across different asset classes. We're in conversations right now with about five to six uh, climate action groups uh, to make this a de facto standard. We're working alongside with them uh, to see how we can standardize this process. And one of the things that we're really trying to do right now, which is a core and you know, core value for us, is to create this impact consortium, right? A consortium of climate action groups who would come in and adopt this metric as a de facto standard across different green projects, right? And sustainability-based projects. And it's, uh, while this is not a core of our product, um, this is something that we're really, really trying to hard, uh, trying hard to push forth uh, and adopt, right? Uh, because the more people that come into a platform like this and more people start speaking a similar language of impact, you realize that a lot more people are going to start seeing impact the way it is, right? Uh, imagine trying to take out uh, a carton of milk, right? Uh, turning back out and seeing an impact score of uh, 100 points or 200 points. Uh, you realize that for every packet of milk that you buy from, let's say, one vendor, um, you're basically creating 200 impact score because you've created brand new jobs because of it. Now, impact consortium is core of what we're doing and it's possible only because of blockchain. Because what we are doing right now is onboarding some of these climate action groups onto a consortium network using Hyperledger Fabric, right? And Hyperledger Fabric is a core of the technology that we're building here. Um, now, obviously enough, I'm supposed to be here to explain to you and sell you why Hyperledger Fabric is simple. Uh, and why it is the right solution for you, right? Um, to be very honest and frank, uh, the amount of support that we personally got from the community, right? Uh, right now uh, versus what it was probably two, three years back when the documentation was really, really difficult to get in, right? Um, the position that we're in right now is super convenient for anyone who wants to look at collaborative networks as a default choice for the solution, right? 
if you believe that there is uh, uh, there is a business model that you can build around these collaborations, right? Uh, around companies that are similar to the problems that you're solving. And you say, hey, listen, I think if we work together on this, um, there's a little more credibility because today, if I am able to get in six, seven, eight, 10 climate action groups together to build this consortium, there is value to this impact score that I'm talking about, right? Versus me just going around and telling people saying, hey, listen, um, you're creating 200 impact score. Uh, the guy's gonna turn back and say, okay, uh, what's in it for that? You know, what's the big deal? Uh, but when I tell him that there are 10 other groups that believe in the same idea, there are 10 other people that measure it the same way, there's genuine value to it. So there's a lot of credibility that can grow into your business model itself by the use of blockchain, right? Beyond the idea of saying, hey, listen, your uh, data is secure, cryptographically hashed, all of that story makes complete sense. And that was blockchain uh, as understood five years back. We already know this. What we really need to harness right now is build unique business models that revolve around this idea of consortiums, right? Uh, that revolves around the idea of collaboration. In the essence of what we are building, a lot of our core principles aligned very well with hyperledger technologies, right? Um, the three of the most important things that we always wanted to work on was empowerment, governance, and democratization. What we wanted to do with what we were building is empower both people who are investors on our platform, as well as people who are providing the assets on the platform, right? Now, what we do with this is basically provide people, um, retail investors like us, the opportunity to invest in sustainability. But at the same time, when you look at the people who are providing these assets itself, we're providing financial tools like this so that we can finance their products, right? Now, how we believe sustainability as an issue is going to be solved is by two things. You either adopt sustainability or you invest in sustainability. Adoption has a huge capital barrier, right? But investment is basically you investing money that you've already saved just as much as you've saved. So we allow people to put money in there and at the same time finance a lot more green projects, accelerating the growth of sustainable solutions and accelerating the amount of adoption that takes place in terms of sustainable solutions. In fact, we're in conversations with a lot of projects in terms of electric mobility. Uh, we are financing about uh, 200 electric vehicle batteries, uh, which is going to further move ahead uh, bike sharing and bike rental processes here in Bangalore. Um, by adoption of green uh, you know, projects. Uh, we also have governance, which brings in a high level of accountability into the process, right? Which is the core of what blockchain systems are. And finally, democratization. About four years back, um, sustainability projects were being financed, right? It's not like we are the first ones to bring in financing to sustainable projects. But what we're doing right now is bringing sustainability-based investments down to retail investors, which wouldn't have possibly been, um, you know, a solution that we would have thought of if it wasn't for thinking of this entire model of tokenization. Uh, just to give a disclaimer right now, um, the tokenization idea is the backbone of framework to make our accounting process and audit auditability process a little more simpler. Um, it's not really a solution, a win-all solution for all, right? Um, you don't really cut down on the paperwork. That's still a back-end work that's going on. But what we believe is when more and more people start adopting the idea of tokenization, when more and more people start building these consortiums, um, regulators at the end of the day must understand and will understand the value of using technologies like this, right? Uh, with that being said, uh, we are currently in a closed beta. Uh, we are housing about 30 to 40 uh, retail investors who are internally buying and selling assets. Uh, we haven't really made it public right now, but uh, feel free to go to paise.in at any time, drop in your details so we'll get back in touch with you. Uh, we're a very lean and agile team of three people, uh, two people focusing on tech, one guy focusing on finance. Um, so we're just a call away from helping you out with what you're doing. Um, once again, uh, I'd like to end this presentation by thanking, you know, Hyperledger, uh, the team, Kamlesh, for just texting me one day and saying, hey, listen, can you just talk about what you guys are building? Uh, because a platform like this is really helping us. So if you'd like to see what we're building, uh, you'd like to be a part of the platform, you want to help us test this out, uh, feel free to go to paise.in and drop in your details. Uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible and onboard you onto the platform. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kamlesh. And sorry for if I exceeded the time. Yeah, that is fine. So uh, thank you, uh, Kostub. And uh, uh, I think you are building in kind of climate action. So we at Hyperledger also have a climate action SIG group. And we are mm. building something. So maybe you could contribute something there too. So mm. I already shared the link in the chat. You could have a look. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And a couple yeah. of questions, maybe you could directly answer in the... I will answer that in the chat box. Yeah. 
absolutely thank you so yeah. uh, thank you brian and over to you Great. Well, um, thank you, Kamlesh. Thank you, Costa. I, I, I obviously, we're really excited about the application of hyperledger technologies to the, the, the fight against climate change and, uh, and the reinvention of the way that electricity markets work. So I was really fascinated to hear about that. Also really uh, appreciative of the conversation about the application of blockchain technology to healthcare and to medical records. Uh, that was actually um, four years ago when I, uh, over four years ago at this point, when I started with hyperledger, one of the areas I thought would be most transformed by the application of distributed ledger technology would be the way information was managed in the health IT space. So really excited to see that uh, picking up speed uh, in India. So uh, I'd like to shift over now uh, and spend our remaining time together uh, the, the next 40 minutes or so with three of the people who are really helping take this technology uh, uh, global in a very, in a very transformative way uh, and aligning their businesses around applying that technology to some really interesting challenges. So uh, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce three uh, individuals uh, who'll be joining us for a panel conversation about that impact. Um, I'd like to start with uh, Shyam Nagarajan, uh, who's the director of go-to-market blockchain networks for IBM services. Also joining us will be Rajesh Dudu, uh, who's the VP and practice leader for blockchain and cybersecurity at Tech Mahindra. And finally, Murali Sapa, who's vice president of engineering at Chainyard. And uh, IBM, uh, Tech Mahindra, and Chainyard are all members of Hyperledger, IBM, of course, being one of the, the founding ones uh, and, and working very closely with uh, both Chainyard and Tech Mahindra on different projects. So uh, really excited to have the three of you here. Um, why don't we start uh, with Shyam? Uh, if you could talk a little bit about some of the work that, that you've been doing with, at IBM uh, with, with Hyperledger Technologies, uh, just to give us a, a flavor, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand the mic to uh, the other two as well afterward. Um, but just spend a few minutes telling us more about uh, kind of your, your the, the, the different projects you've been involved in. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's interesting. My um, journey into blockchain and Hyperledger has been, it's uh, three and a half, four years. So almost the same time as you've been, Brian, ever since we started the decision on um, we needed to have a, a blockchain for business and it needs to be run from an open source organization. Um, that's when it started. Since then, we probably have engaged with about 2,500 2, plus clients around the world doing different um, engagements all the way from, hey, I just want to know what blockchain is. Help me figure it out uh, at a POC level and technology level to, okay, I know what it can do, but I want to do it at a industry level. I want to do it as a differentiator for my organization. So help me build this into a production level application. As of today, and uh, Jerry would, would attest to it, we have 1,100 plus blockchain networks running on our infrastructure, and as well as a, a good portion of them in production, doing active live transactions for themselves and their customers. So um, we have come a long way along. I truly believe that the blockchain market has matured, where the conversation is no longer, is this technology viable to more of what can it do for me and how quickly can I get value from it, which is good conversation. And um, um, over the course of four years, we have learned it's not just about the technology. There is uh, governance, there is business models and monetization, and as well as how do you put your arms around the ecosystem and make everyone feel fair while participating in these uh, um, exercises, these networks, transacting networks. So um, very eager and uh, willing to share my experiences with the rest of the group here. Thank you very much, Shyam. And Rajesh, why don't we move to you? And, and I'll note Tech Mahindra has become, uh, uh, just like with uh, IBM and Chainyard, a Hyperledger certified solutions provider. So I uh, really appreciate uh, uh, Tech Mahindra's support of that direction and your, your leadership on that. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you've been involved in? Yeah, thank you, Brian. At uh, TechM, uh, we do uh, we do a lot of things in the blockchain space. If I have to categorize into three main areas, uh, one is platforms where we build uh, platforms to address some of the tough industry problems. 
The second one is uh, help our customers to integrate uh, blockchain into the native applications. Some of them are basically looking at uh, blockchain as a trusted middleware or to replace some of the legacy technologies like EDI with uh, blockchain. That's what we do. And then the third, uh, we work alongside with several of our global customers to help them develop uh, their own uh, blockchain based uh, applications or blockchain based uh, protocols and some of some of them could be uh, you know proprietary protocols a case in point is samsung they have uh, next ledger which is very very um, uh, uh, compliant with uh, hyperledger as well as uh, the next ledger is compliant with Ethereum. So we've been working with them to develop their stack further, whether it is in terms of including an accelerator or bringing in new services on uh, top of that. Our focus has been primarily from a perspective of an enterprise customer, uh, wherein uh, we've been encouraging our enterprise customers to look at uh, creating their own chain uh, especially in the context of the current digital transformation and in the context of the current pandemic, where some of the traditional technologies have failed them miserably. We've been advocating them to look at uh, blockchain as an important driver of two things. One is in terms of uh, digital transformation. And the second one is in terms of how do they drive network effects along with their set of suppliers as well as, uh, as uh, partners as we speak. Uh, we are also we are also involved in a very very interesting initiative wherein we are putting together a blockchain based uh, platform to track covid vaccine in fact we have received approval from the state government of telangana uh, it, uh, you know of which hyderabad is the capital city and the state government of telangana has given an approval to track all covid related medicines and also the vaccine as and when the vaccine distribution becomes a reality on uh, blockchain. So this is what we've been we've been uh, doing. Uh, happy to talk further. That's that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Morali, you know, Chainyard has uh, done some really great work in in the space. I uh, cite uh, Trust Your Supplier uh, pretty frequently when I'm out there uh, talking about uh, impactful use cases, particularly in the uh, uh, aftermath of the, the global pandemic. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the work that you're you're doing that Chainyard is doing? Thank you, Brian. Um, at Chainyard, we are uh, in this space uh, for more than five years, and our main focus is in the enterprise blockchain adoption and solution implementation. And we also have a lot of experience in consortium building and governance. All these uh, helped us in bringing that uh, trust your supplier solution to uh, fruition. Like uh, we. Uh, worked with IBM, we partnered with IBM and created this supplier, trusted supplier solution, which is a rapid supplier onboarding solution, as you know it, which is causing disruption to the supply chain management, as we know it, right? It's uh, basically we created a network of buyers and suppliers and verifiers of the data. And also we brought in uh, uh, leading organizations representing various industrial verticals into our governance board, right? Uh, and when we saw that uh, there is a major uh, gap in this healthcare industry when COVID hit, right, we were able to quickly uh, transform this network and uh, clone it into another offering called RAPID which helped uh, all this, uh, helped connect uh, the suppliers with the healthcare industry. And uh, when it comes to the projects that we have been working on, we did uh, more than 30 plus projects for various uh, clients in the space, uh, in various industrial domains, like uh, supply chain, transportation, logistics, and financial services. And uh, most of our projects are on Hyperledger, about 70% of them. And another 25% are on Ethereum and the rest are on other blockchain technologies. That's in a nutshell. That's great. Thank you, Morali. So I'm going to ask some tough questions because I, I, I get asked quite a few, uh, uh, quite often, you know, some very, uh, uh, you know, grounding conversations about the, uh, about where blockchain technology really can have a, an impact out there. Uh, and it's, it's great to talk about the theory and the possibilities and such, but these days people are really, they want to know what the results are. And so one of the things that I find personally sometimes challenging is describing the uh, impact of 
of these applications of the deployments. Um, sometimes it does it does require us all to think kind of uh, strategically, but uh, but a lot often the impact is around mitigating risk, and sometimes we have difficulty in pricing the value of mitigating that risk. Right. Um, so I have a question for uh, each of you, which is uh, how do you um, talk about the measurable impact of the deployment of these projects, and are there any examples you can share of of where these projects have had kind of a, a measurable outcome that is, you know, you've been able to take and use as justification to, to grow these projects further. Uh, who wants to who wants to start with that? There are plenty, there are plenty of uh, such uh, projects. Right? Uh, case in point is the TradeX consortium network that we run in the United Kingdom. It's a, that company is minoritily owned by Tech Mahindra, where it is about uh, trade finance, wherein we have been able to put together about 14 or 15 banks on the consortium side. And now what we are doing is we are going on the enterprise side. For example, even in TechM, we do about uh, 100 to 200 million dollars of invoice discounting with a bank in Singapore. And to be honest, I, I can't name the bank, but to be honest, most of the 100 to 200 million dollars of invoice discounting is done on a glorified Excel. And then uh, when things go well, it's all good, but things don't go well. It's a wild goose chase in terms of, you know, what went wrong, who went wrong. And then it can also triggers a lot of dispute uh, between the parties. So, for, so what we have done is uh, based on the concept of eat your own dog food, uh, we have uh, we have piloted that within TechM, where in this particular bank in Singapore, uh, we we mandated to them if you want to do invoice discounting, which can go up to half a billion dollars, you need to come on to this particular platform and then uh, and then see the benefit of the platform either through smart contracts, either through auditability, transparency, various elements that are involved in a complex invoice discounting uh, process. So we have used that uh, internally with, uh, with TechM. Another project that I can talk about, which is very, very relevant in the current context, uh, especially in uh, United Kingdom, uh, the Brexit has happened. Everybody uh, joyfully enjoyed the Brexit outcome. But uh, now the kind of hard reality hit them. The hard reality is if you take Netherlands, uh, if you uh, if you take the distance between UK and Netherlands, hardly about 400 to 500 miles. And before the goods used to flow very, very easily because both of them happen to be part of uh, EU. And now if they want to get the goods across, they have to do what is, uh, they have to do the import export regulation. And they have, uh, they have forgotten about import export regulations between UK and EU. So a hard reality hit on HMRC, Her Majesty, royalty and customs saying that uh, goods can flow only if the documentation is in place. So they said, okay, why don't we go back and reinstate what we used to do before, uh, uh, I mean, basically go back to the practice that was in existence. And that practice is all based on paper. And in the current world, nobody wants to touch paper for export and import documentation because paper is a medium of COVID. And then they kind of realized, oh boy, we are sitting on a big problem now. So what is the problem? The problem, one is paper. The second one is in terms of an ability to collate information from terminal operating systems, from port operating systems. Uh, and then aggregate the information from the third party logistics companies and the four party logistics companies. Now you have a random set of data which is coming from multiple sources and there is no system per se to aggregate it in a common uh, interface and then drive trust on basis of that. So now uh, we're working with them along with uh, British Telecom wherein they want to create an open reach kind of an initiative their uh, uh, their desired state or the uh, or in terms of their dream state is they should have in terms of drive through between these two borders and as the goods drive through the borders the export import regulation should happen in a seamless fashion so these are the things that we are seeing i did mention to you about uh, the covid vaccine tracking as well so in terms of what we are seeing is, especially where there is a need to solve some tough business problem, where there is an uh, interplay of multiple people and the data coming in all kinds of formats, we are seeing a very good traction for blockchain. And I can go on with few more. <laughs> 
That's, that's, that's great. Shyam, would you like to, to go next? Yeah, I was, I was just going to chime in. I mean, Rajesh um, is pointing out where um, there are some really good business impacts. See, my experience is that business impact has always been point in time, right? An organization is uh, embarking on a particular journey and at any point, what they've invested versus what they gain as uh, outcome is always different. That said, um, what we've also seen is that the quickest impact that you see from organizations is usually cost efficiency. Um, cost efficiency doubles down. Sometimes um, it hides under, under the guises of compliance. It, it, it is um, operational efficiency, so dispute resolution, all of these things. A great example is uh, Home Depot. Home Depot has been um, on, this, on this journey of blockchain for a while. Um, we instituted helping put together a reconciliation platform on Hyperledger Fabric between uh, Home Depot and its uh, suppliers. Um, they have about 400 plus suppliers that provide them all, all kinds of goods. And the issue is there's a big chunk of their invoices that goes into disputes because parts break. You know, what ship wasn't what was received and therefore it goes into a bucket and the bucket typically takes about uh, 90 days to get resolved that implies cash blocked for the supplier as well as home depot because it goes into some kind of escrow process to get resolved so uh, a, a reconciliation uh, system that was put in place cost efficiency primarily focused and it reduced um, the time it took to resolve a dispute as well as the dispute itself by about 65 percent a huge reduction Right, and then you, it impacts in terms of uh, liquidity and cash flow uh, coming back. Another great example, uh, a visible example, is in the area of bank guarantees. You know, um, Ligon, uh, Ligon.io. This is actually a consortium of banks based in Australia. Um, we got uh, CBA, Commonwealth uh, Bank of Australia, ANZ Bank, Westpac and as well as some of their reality and uh, utility companies in the market. And um, banks typically issue bank guarantees for any two businesses doing business together. And this is a very you know, uh, tedious process because it takes about a month for these organizations to issue a bank guarantee. A month is a long time in terms of business. So having a platform that was, uh, that's was that been in production for about a year and a half now, um, it, it took down the time it took for a month to be issued a, a guarantee to a day. And that's significant move, uh, overall industry optimization, right? And then the last one that I'll tell you is about um, opening up new revenue. Um, Bolsa de Comercio in Santiago, Chile, uh, stock exchange. You know, it's a, it's a smaller market compared to New York or uh, London Stock Exchange, but it's a very uh, viable stock exchange for the market. And uh, they didn't have complex products. I mean, um, short sell of, uh, and securities lending was an area that they were venturing in, very low volume, very low uh, uh, dollar values with, that was transacting. So we helped put together um, a platform that actually uh, connected all their institutional investors and as well as uh, brought in new international investors into the market and create a whole new market for them. Now it's transacting at $300 million a day um, in, in the market. So that's new revenue that the stock exchange did not have that they were able to get. To. So um, the point is all of these are constructed behind very strong business um, initiative, business sponsorship, business anchoring that's necessary in order for you to get the um, business impact. That's terrific. I mean, I, it just prompts me to, to note we should be working uh, with, with all of you on uh, capturing some of these stories. I know sometimes it's hard to get permission from the customers and, and others to, to tell uh, these, ex give these examples of impact, but we try really hard to document uh, and work with many of the companies out there on uh, case studies that we put out on the Hyperledger website to try to help people understand how to, how to start to recognize the, the value of deploying these networks. I also note sometimes it feels like you really need a, a company that's on 
honest with itself about where um, where they're hitting challenges. Often, uh, the motivations there are sometimes on the CIO's part, sometimes even further down, is to kind of obscure the uh, when things go wrong, you know, or the costs of doing things an old way. Um, and it takes a, a certain amount of internal honesty to go, no, this is actually a more complicated procedure than than we really uh, uh, need to deal with, or, or something that that has resisted automation because it's been so personal driven, person personnel driven. I, I that you know that, that that seems like it's a challenge. Um, Morale, can you give us some examples of uh, some of the, the the impact that the projects uh, that you've worked on have seen? Yeah, sure. Uh, Rajesh and Shem made some very good points. Right, we can pick up any business process for that matter and look at the inefficiencies in it and engineer it for a better efficiency. Right, we can uh, take care of all the absurd uh, issues. But when you add a blockchain, what we observed is the transparency and the trust that brings uh, it really amplifies uh, those uh, results. Right, that's one of the things. And I'll quote two of our uh, projects. Uh, in our contract sourcing and management, we were able to eliminate uh, the blocked invoices by 100% and 100% compliance uh, to contract at paying terms. Right, and uh, there was a 50% reduction in the cycle time and a 30 to 50% reduction in cost per invoice. So, this is uh, one project, and uh, in our Trust your suppliers, what we found was uh, there is a seven to 10 times ROI over three years period, right? This is because of the reduced uh, supplier onboarding, which used to take uh, months before. Now we can do it in days. On top of it, we can manage the supplier life cycle Right, uh, we have provided uh, integration with the multiple verifiers of the data. So at the real time, you can get any changes uh, and you can calculate the new risk uh, that is associated with any supplier. So what it means is for a buyer, right, they now can initiate a business uh, with any supplier in no time. And for a supplier, we are providing a, a trusted supplier identity, right, that, can, that they can take uh, with them to any other uh, uh, buyer and get onboarded in no time. So th these are some of them are direct uh, uh, metrics that you can see, like uh, 7 to 10 times ROI. And others are indirect, where uh, instead of uh, waiting for three months uh, to start your transactions, now you're doing in days, right? That really helps the businesses to grow. That's that's fascinating. Thanks. Thanks, Morali. Um, before we jump into kind of a more technical side of this conversation, and by the way, I should mention, if anybody listening has questions they'd like us to take on, please submit them into the Q&A function, because we will leave 10 minutes uh, before we wrap up to try to talk as a panel about any questions that have been submitted. Um, but first, let me ask kind of a more lightweight question, um, which is, you know, we've been on uh, uh, together, I mean, mo most of you as well, have, have been working on this for the last four years, this fight for a the concept of blockchain on the enterprise, blockchain for business, right? And the word blockchain, um, obviously, you know, it goes back to uh, that the, um, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper for Bitcoin, perhaps even people have noted earlier examples of that term. Uh, it's obviously a very technical term, but it's become this, this hype, uh, hype driven kind of word. Uh, and, you know, for a while, we, we certainly have distanced ourselves from the cryptocurrency community, I think pretty well with what we've done. But even that word blockchain has triggers uh, uh, some strong sentiments out there. Um, and we ourselves at Hyperledger have asked ourselves, is that is that a word that still reflects accurately the kind of applications being built and the kind of uh, impact that we're having? Um, obviously, uh, one alternative is DLT, uh, 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 distributed ledger technologies. Uh, I've even heard people use the term multi-participant business networks, although that doesn't quite roll off the tongue as easily. What um, have, have you guys since, as you've worked out in the market, I, I, you know, is, does the word blockchain turn more people off or, or is that still a, a, a term that we, we think we can use to describe a lot of what we're doing? Who wants to take that first? I'll give it a shot. Um, look, I, I think um, as when we started, blockchain was very um, Bitcoin connected, right? It, it was a Bitcoin and the concept of a blockchain, you know, links connecting each other was very relevant. And it still was, was relevant, but I still, I, I believe that uh, we have evolved as a community market as well as as a technology and the value that organizations get is um, 
you know, uh, the concept of a decentralized ledger and decentralized technology, all of that um, is still around. I believe a more accurate way of um, communicating the value is distributed ledger technology. I think it's, it still applies, still is valuable. You can probably connect it to all kinds of technology protocols that's out there, including Ethereum and R3 Coda and uh, others. Um, it, it's a lot easier to communicate that than a blockchain. Um, a blockchain still reminds people of uh, Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum. And so that's, that's my take. That's it. I, I guarantee you this is going to go through several revisions and evolutions before we settle on a particular term. term. Yeah. Uh, uh, any, anyone else want to comment? Yeah, we use uh, interchangeably to describe our product because at the end of the day, it is DLT, which is implemented using blockchain underneath, right? And as uh, Sham said, it has a negative connotation, blockchain. The moment you talk about it, you'll be thinking about Bitcoin. But at the same time, we observed that a lot of people think of it as a magic bullet. So we try to balance these expectations and then describe uh, what we are doing. Okay. Um, why don't I jump uh, into something a bit more more technical? Uh, and you know, starting any new enterprise project for a customer uh, it can be a challenge, right? You know, enterprise IT is you know there's so many touch points often to make it valuable that uh, it can be a lot of work. <clears throat> uh, but I think blockchain technology raises that even further, given it's still a relatively young technology, and to make it successful, it's really you know there's no such thing. I think I I first heard this from uh, IBM. There's no such thing as a blockchain chain of one, you know, uh, it's a team sport, right? Um, but, but technologically speaking, what have been some of the biggest challenges with launching these networks? Um, uh, you know, we at Hyperledger try to, you know, be very conscious of the fact that these are young technologies still. Um, but where, where have perhaps there been some biggest roadblocks as, as you've worked with customers in getting, the, getting to a, a, a pilot or a proof of concept even? And then re, uh, really importantly to me, uh, as you transition to something production where you've got a, now a community of stakeholders on, what have been some of the biggest technical or technology related challenges? In, in terms of at least in my conversations with uh, customers, uh, they want to know the complete security aspects of uh, blockchain. Uh, they also want to know in terms of, for example, if there is, uh, if they come across um, uh, suboptimal functionality or maybe a bug, how can, uh, how fast it can be addressed, especially in an open source kind of a technology. In fact, uh, we have reached out to Julian for help, uh, one of the world's largest manufacturer of computers. They wanted to know that they want to internalize this uh, blockchain and replace completely the electronic data interchange for their purchase functions. And if they are investing so much in that kind of a functionality, and if they come across any of the security incidents or, uh, or bugs, how can they uh, how can they internalize an open source technology wherein the entire community will run as fast as they as they want to or how can they how can they get into their uh, roadmap on an accelerated fashion so these are some of the things that we we come across uh, and of course there there are many uh, operational challenges that most of these challenges come because of the nature of the environment in which they want to implement blockchain and also in terms of the network controls that they would like to implement so this is more um, uh, endemic to their network or to uh, to their organizational context rather than a technical challenge with the protocol itself yeah, just, just to read, um, reaffirm Rajesh's point, um, look, only 20% of the blockchain projects is actually to do with the blockchain technology. The other 80% is um, other technologies, including Kubernetes and um, security and uh, IoT and AI, because at the end of the day, the customer is trying to solve a business problem. Right. And blockchain becomes that, that big backbone framework for the data uh, collection and confirmation of what they are um, as it goes through the process. What we find is that operationally, 
it introduces a lot of challenges because now you have to maintain um, all these different technologies together in a pack that has to move in, in evolution. When you know, Hyperledger went from 1.4 to 2.0, that caused a lot of uh, you know, heartburn for our customers who were already in production. How you gotta move the data, you gotta move the code versions and you have to make it all compliant along with making sure all the other technologies continue to work well together. So, um, but stepping back, this is not unusual. We have been, we have been um, in a world where we are used to technical debt and this is one of those that we take on and continue to chug along. That said, in future, I would hope this gets factored in some of our decision making at the open source level, how to make it operationally much easier and simpler, and as well as integrated, integrate into uh, some of the other um, parallel technologies that exist in the market as well. Right, right. Hard to escape the, uh, uh, whenever you're crossing a major release number, that's always an opportunity to uh, uh, do some refactoring, some cleanup and, and changes to APIs. But of course that has ripple effects uh, and uh, uh, can uh, uh, be a challenge if you, if you really want people to keep upgrading quickly, which uh, with Fabric, I know, you know the, there's been a long-term support uh, LTS uh, strategy around the, the 1.4 release and now around 2.2 which is intended to help address that concern, uh, which is, well, if I'm buying into, if I'm gonna upgrade to Fabric 2.2, how much longer, uh, you know, before I have to take another disruptive change to a 3.0 or whatever. Uh, and that's 18 months after the date of release of 2.2, which was the, the LTS release for the 2X series. Um, and even 18 months sounds very short when you're thinking about enterprise systems where in many uh, instances, we're still running COBOL from 40 years ago. Um, so uh, admittedly, you know, I, I, this is still a fast moving domain and there's some cost to being on the, the bleeding edge of that technology or even the, the I, I, you know, the slightly one step back from bleeding edge. Um, but, I, I, but there's also a lot of important innovation happening and performance improvements and features being added. Uh, so um, yeah, that's, that's certainly a, a challenge keeping people up. Um, Morali, any, any other thoughts on this topic? Yeah, uh, I echo the similar sentiments. Basically, security and compliance are the major pain points. Right? We had to do a lot of convincing, particularly with associated cryptography and when you're trying to deploy it globally. And if uh, GDPR uh, related issues are coming to like if the personally identifiable information has to be stored, right? Uh, there are many places where we had to uh, store it off chain. Some of the data we had to decide what goes on chain and what goes off chain uh, to meet these uh, considerations. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's a major one, right? Uh, Data privacy yeah. is a major. And then comes the key management, right? Uh, multiple times we run into uh, discussions with the clients, uh, how like uh, the participants, how their keys are going to be stored on the blockchain, right? And uh, whether it is accessible to the others, how the data is kept. Uh, private for uh, th th this has, and how how to make it selectively visible to the participants is another major concern right and uh, business network engineering like uh, sham has pointed out when we moved from ibp to version 2 right the moment uh, it became from private to public right we had to do a lot of uh, re-engineering uh, to make sure that it is uh, uh, all the, uh, like, we had to make use of Kubernetes clusters and deploy them and then set up the firewalls and then make sure uh, we do a lot of pen tests in the cluster, in the buyer environments to show them that uh, and share those results uh, with them. And we also had to do a lot of POCs uh, to make sure that their identity and access management solution works. Uh, so we had to integrate into their SSOs. Uh, so th these are some of the things that we ran into. Yeah, no, I, 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 it, it strikes me uh, that there is a whole field of architecture and, 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 and engineering that is novel to this space about figuring out what goes on chain versus off chain, 
how do you prove things like the provenance of a, an object, you know, using a ledger without giving away traffic information about the nodes, you know, uh, uh, you know, right. the flow through a supplier, for example, you know, is considered, you know, pretty sensitive data, but you still want to see this diamond step through these different hops, right? So it strikes me that there's a field of blockchain architecture, blockchain engineering, that's perhaps as novel as say when SQL databases first started to emerge and the field of database architect was really required to understand how the structure structure and uh, of the database related to the performance expectations and the the suitability for purpose in other ways so um, that that I think is one of the more challenging kind of long-term aspects and it's certainly why you know it's, it's been really great within fabric to have an examples repository uh, and uh, to have a lot of uh, conversations in fact there's a there's a weekly call for developers building on top of fabric uh, that's hosted by the, the 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 fabric maintainers where people can say I'm trying to do this is this the right way to use the SDKs or, or that that sort of thing. So um, I want to turn, uh, I, I, we've had one question submitted, which gets back to more of the kind of business setting, uh, which is really about uh, the application, uh, as it was asked by uh, Anurag, I'm sorry, uh, the question disappeared, so I, I forget the full name, um, uh, about uh, how do you convince companies to take a leap into this space, uh, you know, as a potential replacement for existing ERP solutions. And I think we focused a little bit on how do you make the, the business case around impact, but let me try to re reposition the question a little differently, which is um, within enterprises, within companies, I, I often, obviously you all work with um, the, bud the budget, uh, people who have the budget to, to do some work, um, but it, be interesting to me to understand does the pressure for adoption of this technology tend to come top down where you know a ceo uh, heard hey we should be looking into this or they read about it in the economist and they go we need to think and and then it's kind of a top down driven kind of thing or do you think it often or, or as much or, or more perhaps a bottoms up kind of thing where an engineer or a systems architect or, or somebody in the partnerships program around a, a customer is saying, no, we really need a way to systematize this thing that we're doing informally today with pieces of paper and fax machines and that sort of thing. Um, how do you see the, the case often being made uh, inside of these companies, top down or more bottoms up? So, I, I mean, if it's okay with um, other panelists, let me start and then they can, we can add. Um, Go ahead, Shai. This is interesting position. Um, look, the interest of blockchain as a technology is very uh, appealing for a lot of developers in the market, right? So a lot of projects do get started at that level. There's interest, there's hackathons, and there is, uh, uh, hey, I look what cool thing that I did in my organization because I uh, play around with this technology. It's very valuable. I think that kind of innovation is uh, uh, interesting for organizations. But what we find is a lot of these innovation uh, agendas die um, because they don't get the right business support in the, in the organization, right? Um, what we've also found is that when we go top down, say when, especially when organizations are looking to, I mean, now is a good, good time where um, it's COVID, everyone is struggling with uh, uh, innovations, getting to new markets, new customers, are, actually starting to optimize. And there's only so much cost efficiency and op optimization that you can do within a company, right? You, know, you can be the most efficient company in the world, but if you don't have new customers, then you don't have anyone paying you money. So um, it's time to start looking outside the organization. How do you get control over the processes that cross the enterprise boundaries? And uh, that's where uh, blockchain really starts to appeal. Um, off late, I've been finding more traction at the uh, CFO level because that's where, at the end of the day, invoices and uh, purchase orders uh, get cut, and they find it uh, difficult to get a hold of uh, how they manage their um, external interactions. So it's a very interesting place uh, where it goes. And then the other place where I, I usually find a lot of support is at the uh, board of directors and the C, C level, the CEO, CEO, because they are looking at um, what new markets do I need to go, what growth initiatives that I need to support, and how do I really uh, leapfrog my competition. So again, connecting all these dots, the innovation agenda helps them look at some what's possible, but at the end of the day, it doesn't connect back to the business agenda, and it doesn't, doesn't grow as much. Mm -hmm. Open up. Any, Morali or Rajesh, any other thoughts? 
fully agree with uh, with Chiang uh, in terms of there has to be a linkage uh, between uh, both the groups. But uh, uh, also in my experience, uh, there is no one straight answer to your question, uh, Brian, uh, because in some cases, you know, there's a very uh, learned uh, uh, CXO or the chief digital officer who would like to explore this or somebody has joined an organization to lead the innovation function and they have to show the differentiated approach. So then a blockchain or any of the emerging technology becomes an important element of their approach. The, uh, I've also heard uh, scenarios where uh, people at the mid level uh, are very, very convinced about it but they don't get appropriate budgets, not the attention from the from the top layer. So they basically kind of went out their frustration saying they just don't get it, but we want to do it. Our business needs it. I don't know why they don't uh, they, why they don't uh, don't get it. So that approach is uh, approach is also there. I've been in conversations where uh, people after listening to the entire value proposition and the tech stack, um, they've said, you know, I'll just put Kafka over there and accomplish my requirements. So why do I need blockchain if I can put Kafka over there and then complete the task? So in terms of there is not much, uh, uh, you know, a holistic appreciation of what it is going to do from a technology perspective and also from a business perspective. If you're putting a blockchain to uh, increase incremental efficiencies in an existing business, I think that's not a, that's not a good approach. Probably the guys who are involved in that project, all of them will get promoted, but the POC will not go beyond the <laughs> POC stage. It will not not progress into into an enterprise adoption perspective. So it has to be seen uh, holistically from a business perspective, from a technology perspective, and also realize that some of the traps that are there with regards to their own understanding. And that is more important. So who is going to bell the cat with regards to the traps of uh, their own understanding or limitations in understanding pertaining to the technology? So if you address from all these aspects, then uh, then there could be a good potential. Great. Yeah. Morali, any other? Yeah, go ahead. Right. It happens both ways, right? Uh, normally, we get a, a top-down uh, requirement and also developers would be thinking about how to get into this kind of a space, right? We do a lot of consultancy. So what we observe is whenever we get uh, somebody with a requirement, we look at it from multiple points of view. We see whether they're just trying to replace uh, an enterprise applications database with blockchain and say that it is blockchain or are they, is there a possibility of a network, right? Uh, unless there is a network, uh, there, uh, it doesn't really make sense uh, to go to blockchain or any other. We can keep the data encrypted. We can keep it uh, the way we want, secure and all those things, right? That's one of the things. And the other major thing that we look at is to see if there is an anchor tenant and a sponsor, right? Uh, th this makes a lot of difference. And uh, most of the successful blockchain uh, networks are the ones which span across multiple industries. Right, unless you have uh, participants from multiple uh, in this, uh, segments of this, uh, you really don't uh, make much of an impact. On top of it, whether uh, there is uh, enough interest uh, for uh, people to join as governance members and uh, direct the future path, right? Unless uh, these items are in place, uh, it doesn't become a success. Great. Well, this has been a really fascinating conversation. I really deeply appreciative to Murali, to Rajesh and Shyam for sharing your perspectives on both the business and the technology challenges, but also really opportunities here uh, that <clears throat> all, of, all of you have seen with the deployment of blockchain technologies. Uh, with that, uh, I'll hand the microphone back to Kamlesh to, to wrap everything up. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Brian, and thank you, everyone. Siam, Rajesh, Murli, Heron, and Julian, and complete Hyperledger team. Especially they uh, helped me to organize this meetup, uh, marketing from the Hyperledger team side. And I think Siam and coming on board and Rajesh is agreed to be speak. So I think it's really great. And I think it's a great learning when we even share the recording. So I think hundreds of people watch it. And when such enterprise leaders talk about the blockchain adoption, 
really inspiring and learning for all. And, and thanks as well to Ananda, uh, uh, Anand Mishra and Kaustab for, for their great presentations as well. Sorry, I was just saying special kudos to Kamlesh for keeping out Mr. Murphy this time around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and thanks to everyone who's helped uh, put this together and to all of you for attending. Um, it was great and certainly look forward to another, another early morning, late night conversation with our international friends. Thank all you, right. everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye. Bye. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Just